In today's video, with the help of the cadavers here in the lab, we're going to take a look at the heart and discuss exactly how it's able to contract dependably over the course of your lifetime, as in somewhere around two and a half billion times over the course of your lifetime. That is the definition of a workhorse. It's going to be a bumpy one. Let's do this. The heart is unique in the fact that it's capable of self-excitation, meaning that it doesn't require input from the brain in order to contract. Now the brain is still definitely involved, but it's important to note that the heart can contract on its own if it needs to. In fact, if I were to take a heart from a living person and place it here on this table, it would then contract on its own for around three to four minutes before succumbing to oxygen deprivation. Inside of the heart are specialized cells called pacemaker cells, which are modified versions of normal cardiac cells. Now, there's a group of these cells located in what's called the right atrium of the heart, near the entrance of a gigantic blood vessel called the superior vena cava. Now, these group of cells are called the sinoatrial node, or SA node for short. Now, the SA node is capable of depolarizing, which will cause the neighboring cardiac cells to contract while also initiating a cascade of coordinated muscular contraction to go through the heart. Put simply, the SA node is the heart's natural pacemaker, causing the two atria to contract first and then the two ventricles. Under normal resting conditions, SA node causes the heart to beat anywhere between 60 and 100 beats per minute, although depending on the individual and the situation, that can definitely change and still be considered normal. However, this contracting cascade happens so quickly that it needs to be slowed down so that the atria can push all of the blood into the ventricles before the ventricles contract. This is the job of the next group of specialized cells called the atrioventricular node or the AV node. Now the AV node is gonna be located in the wall that separates the left and right atria called the interatrial septum. The AV node delays the impulse for around a tenth of a second and then that conductive cascade can continue down into the ventricles. Interestingly, if the SA node fails, the AV node can take over, acting as the new pacemaker. The only problem is it's at a significantly slower rate of around 40 to 60 beats per minute. But hey, at least the heart is still beating. The impulse next travels to another bundle of specialized cells called the bundle of hiss. Now, it may look as though it should be pronounced his instead of hiss. It's actually named after Wilhelm Hiss Jr., who's the first to discover that it physically linked the atria to the ventricles. But the bundle of Hiss is located at the base of the interatrial septum, and then it's going to divide into two descending branches. These branches, unsurprisingly, are called the left and right bundle branches. The bundle branches are going to be located in the interventricular septum, which separates the left and right ventricles. The left bundle branch is then going to further separate into what's known as the anterior and posterior fascicle. But we now have an impulse that's traveling down towards the most inferior aspect of the heart and it's then once again going to split into what are known as the Purkinje fibers. Purkinje fibers are specialized cells that have lots of mitochondria which are vital for creating energy that the heart will definitely need. Now they're just underneath the epithelial layer of the heart called the endocardium. The endocardium is the innermost layer of the heart and comes into direct contact with the blood itself. Now it's the job of these Purkinje fibers to transmit that impulse to the contractile heart cells inside of the myocardium or that muscular layer of the ventricles. It's important to note that myocardial contraction occurs at the tip of the heart, known as the apex, and from there will then move superiorly. This allows for the blood to be ejected in a directional manner. Imagine if the ventricles were just contracting everywhere all at once, it would cause the blood to just go in every direction imaginable, dramatically reducing its efficiency. All right, so now that we understand how the signal gets from the SA node down to the Purkinje fibers, let's see exactly why this is useful in medicine. Whether you've seen it in the hospital firsthand or through the various medical shows and movies, we're all familiar with the electrocardiogram or ECG. The ECG, which is the exact same thing as an EKG, is a highly effective method at determining the heart's electrical activity. Each point on an ECG tells you something about where the heart is during its conductive cycle, as well as how strong or weak that conductivity is. The first blip on the ECG is what's known as a P wave, 
and it represents the SA node depolarizing as well as the muscle tissue inside of the atria themselves. Picture this, an impulse is spreading through the atria, getting them ready to contract. You'll then notice a straight line segment between the P and Q waves. This represents the atria actually contracting, thereby pushing blood into the ventricles. The next three waves are usually combined to form what's known as the QRS complex. It's easily the biggest spike on an ECG, so it probably comes at no surprise that it's going to be covering a lot of cardiac real estate. The QRS complex is the depolarization of the ventricles, starting at the interventricular septum and then spreading into the entirety of the ventricular myocardium. This is where the impulse is traveling from the AV node to the bundle of Hiss, down the left and right bundle branches to the Purkinje fibers, and then spreading into the muscle fiber of the heart itself. Now the segment between the S and T waves represents the period of time that the ventricles are actually contracting. Again, pushing blood upwardly from the apex towards the lungs and to the rest of the body. The T wave represents the ventricles repolarizing, essentially preparing themselves to become depolarized again. Now, interestingly, the atria also repolarize, except it happens at the same time as the QRS complex. So it gets drowned out in the ECG and you just simply can't see it. We then find ourselves back at the beginning, waiting for the SA node to kick things off so that we can see the P wave once again. Now that we understand exactly what's happening under normal conditions, let's talk about abnormal conditions, or specifically what are known as heart arrhythmias, or what most would just refer to as an irregular heartbeat. And the reason why I say it like that is because heart arrhythmias are actually pretty complex, and they encompass many other issues besides just conductive problems, such as like with the SA node, AV node, or others. In fact, Jonathan and I plan on doing future videos discussing and detailing many of these heart arrhythmias, so for now, I'm gonna be pretty broad and relatively brief. Tachycardia is generally considered to be a heart rate in excess of 100 beats per minute. However, there's a ton of nuance to this because anyone who's exercising is gonna have a heart rate over 100 beats per minute, meaning that tachycardia doesn't mean you have a heart problem. However, if you're sitting on the couch, you know, watching some curiosity stream and rocking a heart rate of 180, that probably demands some attention. You see, tachycardia can happen in the ventricles or in the atria, and depending on which one, you're gonna get different symptoms and consequences. And depending on which one it is, you'll see something different on the ECG. Bradycardia is essentially the exact opposite with a heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute. Again though, highly fit individuals can have a resting heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute and adults when they're sleeping can also have a heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute and both are obviously considered to be okay. But for certain individuals, it can be a precursor for more intensive heart conditions and in some cases may necessitate an artificial pacemaker to take over for the heart's natural pacemaker. Fibrillation tends to be one of those heart conditions that a lot of people are familiar with. You could think of it as an almost random but definitely disorganized contraction of the heart. Again, it can happen in either the atria or the ventricles and both of them will come with their own unique set of consequences ranging from mildly concerning to almost a guaranteed fatality. Thanks for watching everyone. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you in the next video.